speaking, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this evening's program. Henry Fair, Nature as Inspiration for Art and Life. You all set? Tonight's presentation is the latest in a series of programs we've initiated in conjunction with our project to open a new permanent exhibit on uh, the art of the Adirondacks. The exhibit, Artists and Inspiration of the Wild, will open on July 1, 2023. Gallery renovations are currently underway. And those of you who've been on campus have seen all the fences and equipment, et cetera. I'm going to comment. This is our first program that we've offered both live and that we are also live streaming. So uh, if we have some technical difficulties this evening, I hope you'll all forgive us. We're, we're finding our way. Um, and tonight's program is being recorded and will be up on our website later this week. Uh, before proceeding further, I'd like to acknowledge the Adirondack experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people uh, continue to live in this region today and practice their teachings and life ways. So I'm delighted to introduce our three speakers. First of all, we have Henry Fair, who is seated at the center, a distinguished photographer whose work can be seen this year at the museum in our special exhibition, Scarred Landscapes. Henry is not only a photographer, but an environmental activist. Known for his chillingly beautiful environmental aerial photos, Henry has called attention to the environmental challenges in our world in different regions and he's been doing this for many years and often he connects his concerns with those other social and political issues. He's published three books. Henry is based in New York City and in Berlin. And looking at um, Henry's aerial photographs, one can't help thinking of Seneca Ray Stoddard, the 19th century photographer of the Adirondacks, whose images of the degraded landscape uh, that logging and other human activities created uh, helps spur the environmental movement. And one has to wonder, has anything happened? Has anything changed in the last 150 years? And maybe Henry could talk about that this evening. Uh, we also welcome author and naturalist Ed Cairns, uh, sitting to uh, the right of the audience. Um, Ed provided the commentary for Henry's image in the Sparred Landscapes exhibit. He also appears in a video in that exhibit talking with Henry about his work. You can see Ed regularly here at the Adirondack Experience presenting his weekly naturalist programs and leading weekly guided hikes around the region. His essays have appeared in Adirondack Life, Audubon, and Birders World. He's also published six books. Ed lives with his family on the Saranac River, and the entire family, I might say, appears in an introductory video to our core exhibit, Life in the Adirondack. So you may have seen them all there. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Mitch Tyke, station manager of North Country Public Radio, who will be monitoring this evening's discussion. Mitch is on the far left. Mitch assumed his current position in 2019 after working all over the country, uh, places including Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and Arizona. But most importantly, he had an earlier gig at NCPR in 1996 to 1998. I think we all hear his voice daily. And uh, we owe his team and Mitch a, uh, a vote of thanks for the great job they do uh, for this community. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Mitch, who's our moderator. Thank you so much, David. And thanks to everyone who's uh, joining us in our uh, auditorium here and joining us on the internet. Just a couple of words before we uh, get to our conversation. Uh, if you have questions and you're in our auditorium, you can raise your hand and uh, someone will recognize you. I think we'll, we'll take live questions as we go. If you're joining us via Zoom, you'll find uh, an opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A function. On, uh, on Zoom, and those questions will be relayed to us by Cheryl, who's now at the podium. So, uh, and feel free to, uh, to contribute as we go. I know there's, uh, it's a lot to ask you to sit on your hands for an hour, but I'm looking forward to a really illuminating conversation. And uh, Henry and Ed, thank you so much for, uh, for being willing to do this. Pleasure, Mitch. Thank you for coordinating. Nice to be here. Nice to see you in person. Thank you very much. It was uh, delightful to get to see both of you uh, live and in person here. Um, 
and I guess I, I, I was also told to mention, uh, I know it's sometimes a little quiet using the equipment we have here. So if you're tuning in on Zoom, uh, it's not going to get louder than this. So feel free to, uh, to turn your volume as far up as you are, uh, as is comfortable for you. Um, I want to start with a question for you, Henry Fair, and, and that is how much do you think about what your audience knows or thinks they know about a subject like this as you conceive of the project? How much, how much do, does the, the audience's preconceived notions play into what you try to accomplish? Good question. I first want to speak to people. I don't want to preach to the bar. I want to speak to people who aren't thinking about the issues like extinction and the climate crisis, which preoccupy me. That said, it is a problem that I study these subjects so much that they are second nature to me. And thus, I assume that audience and listeners come from the, the same basic knowledge that I do, and that's wrong. Um, I know a lot about the science, and I know a lot about uh, the different issues, and I need to get better at, uh, at, at giving more background and less detail. Well, and, and, and so as you got into this particular topic, what are the, the areas that you saw either yourself or your audience as the most wrong? The, what, what were the fundamental misunderstandings that seeing photographs and, and you know, we're seeing them over our shoulder right now, but getting this sort of new view of man's impact on the Adirondacks, how did it clarify things for you? I used to come here as a kid. No, I came here when I was in college. Kind of <laughs> and I had not come since then. And when I started doing this project and focusing on the industrial impacts of the Adirondacks, of course, I was trying to make the pictures which have become my trademark, which are beautiful abstracts and terrible things. Um, which lead to irony, which, which cause people to stop and think and ask questions. So I was making that same kind of picture here, and there are industrial impacts in the Adirondacks. But I must say I was overwhelmed by the beauty and the nature, which I had forgotten. And Kant, it, it, it probably surprises a lot of people. Uh, I mean, you take people on nature walks and, and by and large, you're showing them the natural world. Does it surprise people to, to know that there are still human impacts on this area that they're, they're traveling? It does, and it's uh, something that we certainly talk about in just about every walk in the woods because we see the, uh, the vestiges of 19th century, early 20th century logging. Everywhere we go, we see evidence of clear cutting, evidence of selective cutting, old growth trees being left here and there. And uh, it, uh, it's the, the, the industrial history of the Adirondacks is really inseparable from the natural history. And if I can interrupt, Ed, you told me in our previous meeting here, a very interesting story about ozone pollution today. So there's still industrial impacts impacting the Adirondacks as we speak, even though many of the industries are no longer here. Yeah, I worked as a park ranger at Acadia National Park uh, for a year and had a very depressing day of uh, air quality training <laughs> with an air quality expert who worked for the National Park Service. And he pointed out that these hazy summer days we get, I always thought the haze was just humidity, but apparently a, a major component of the haze is ozone. And the damage to the leaves of the trees is widespread. And you see it everywhere you go. And that's coming up from the industrial corridor of New York, Boston, Washington, or that's right. coming? Yeah, from... Man, mainly from the, the coast. And a lot of it is from automobile. 
stuff. Yeah. So we like to, we sort of let ourselves off the hook a little bit, I think, sometimes. We think about environmental impacts, we think about those those big bad people in the Midwest with the big factories and the smokes stacks making all the millions of dollars. But you know, it's it's not just big industrial sources of pollution. A lot of it's just coming from people driving to and from work in the grocery store. I'm told um, that uh, we need to, uh, as my wife would describe me all the time, use our outdoor voices a little more, uh, just to be a little more audible uh, for our uh, for our virtual audience. So uh, I will try to be mindful of that. Um, Henry, you were talking a minute ago about um, the irony uh, that's sort of inherent in this exhibit and a lot of what you do. How important to you is is this inner conflict between the aesthetic beauty and and what it represents, you know, the aesthetic beauty of this man-made stuff and what it really represents, which is destruction. In fact, it's essential to this body of work because the pictures are, are graphically beautiful, but yet when we take that second look, we understand that it is something horrible. And again, Without that irony, that double take, we would stop and consider it. And again, I'm looking for I'm looking for the unconverted. I would rather I would rather somebody who doesn't believe the science in climate crisis to stop and think about my pictures than someone who does. Do, do you think as a society, are, are we kind of jaded at this point? If, if you took pictures of destruction that, that looked like destruction, would it not have the same impact? Exactly. If we see a picture of a denuded hillside, we don't even stop and look at it. I guess I, I'm hoping to have you kind of take us through the, the creative process that uh, resulted in this really your remarkable exhibit. Um, but before we even get to the, the photographs themselves, why did you choose the Adirondacks? You know, having not been here since your college days, what got you thinking about this place? A group called the Northeast Wilderness Trust asked me to uh, go and document a uh, piece of land which was up for development, in fact, just across the border into Canada. I called Whitehawk, which is a group of environmental pilots that flies me frequently, that collaborates with me, and asked them to find me a pilot. And they found one who actually lives on the west side of the Adirondacks. And so the three of us flew up to Canada, but we flew over the Adirondacks. And we started with um, the giant paper mill on Champlain. And I got amazing pictures of their plume coming up into the, into the lake. And of course, I do a tremendous amount of research. Everything is research. So I started to research that paper mill. And there is a plume of sludge on the bottom of Lake Champlain, a meter thick from 30 years of that paper mill spewing their toxics into that lake. And then we went up to Canada, made the pictures, came back, photographed various other things, and that started this project. And then we started talking with the museum, and they said, oh, we'd love to do an exhibit. And it took some time to develop, and that gave me time to take the pictures. I, I want to go down that, uh, that road to mix metaphor. <laughs> um, uh, in just a moment, but I'm told we have a uh, we have a question already from our uh, from our virtual audience. We do. It actually it speaks just to what you were just referring to. So we have a few people who are wondering um, if these images are all from the Adirondacks, the ones that um, we're showing on the screen, and then also if you could just talk about them, if you can identify them, and I could pause any of the ones that you would like me to. They are all from the Adirondacks, um, and again, I uh, I acknowledge in guilt that I couldn't bring myself to show only the industrial impacts. I had to show the beauty <laughs> because looking at this one, so my pilot is named Bob Keller and he 
is a great man. He flies me all over the place. And that picture before was flying through the high peaks. Now that's a that's a life-changing experience that nobody gets. I, you know, and I do these things. I flew through the high peaks at, you know, the, the height of the top of Mount Marcy. And again, I was just dumbstruck by this, this reservoir of nature and beauty and wildness here in the Northeast, which is, you know, I'm sure if you live here, you take it for granted. Well, but you can't, the, you live here and it's so beautiful and nature is right there at your door. And, you know, you probably have to chase the black bears away when you go out in the morning, whatever. The world is in a crisis and we've got to act now. And we've got to change systematically. We've got to change a lot of things and we've got to preserve this stuff. I mean, and we've got to rewild. Anyway, yeah, so this one is, um, uh, uh, um, what's the, sorry, uh, Taws. That's, that's a lake at Taws. I'm not sure if those dead trees on that frozen lake are the result of toxics, but graphically it's a wonderful image. Uh, it's not in the exhibit. Uh, or the curator and I dialogued about what to, what to hang and came up with with a group and this wasn't in it um but it is one of my favorites well and i think maybe we can we can visit with some of these uh some of these photographs as the conversation goes, though, on, as we go. that goes on um, uh, but i guess to pick up where we left off uh, you talked about research and you know, I think maybe we a lot of us had this romantic ideal that you know you went up with Bob Keller in the plane, and, and there was all this serendipity to oh my gosh, look down there, I wonder what that is. But in order to be able to do this without being up in the air for you know weeks at a time, you really had to know what you were looking for. Yeah, and um, the, I queried everyone as we were building this exhibit board members for what what are, what do you know about what should i look for uh, bob was a fantastic source of information and history and is also a great source of information and history um, and so yes i must know where the things are and of course Having a satellite on the internet is makes things a lot easier than they used to be. But then I there's a lot of research afterwards, like the research on this paper mill. And you know, and to the degree I I have in a database all of their emissions. I mean, I do that level of research when I photograph something. I want to know what they're emitting into the water, into the air. And, and do you just have a storehouse uh, in your mind from these years of experience of, of where someone like Henry could find plumes of sludge? If, if you went <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, and I, I guess I'm glad I don't. But uh, yeah, I mean, th those are the places I suppose I spend my time avoiding. But, you know, we need to know what, I mean, that this exhibit really brings that to the forefront that we need to not pretend this stuff doesn't exist. Uh, we can obsess in the Adirondacks uh, that we are the biggest park in the lower 48 states. We're uh, three times the size of Yellowstone. My best friend from my park service days was superintendent of Yellowstone for 10 years. I used to tease her that my park was three times bigger than hers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Adirondack region is not all about beauty and wildness and preserved land. It's it's also, uh, there are lots of stories to tell and we need to tell them so we pay attention to them. So we change our ways about impacts at the individual level, industrial levels. And, and uh, this, this exhibit is just cracking that whole subject wide open. And thanks for doing it. <laughs> well, and uh, oops, sorry. No, sorry, go ahead. In a previous life, I raised wolves and taught about wolves. And of course the wolf 
the last wolf killed in the Adirondacks is here at this institution. Uh, and I, every time I come, I stop and pay a little homage to him, her. And of course, that question has been shoved under the mat, if you will, but it needs to be brought back. Should there be wolves in the Adirondacks, um, which would require that humans adjust their lifestyle? But wolves keep an ecosystem healthy. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to get in trouble by raising that little flag <laughs> and, and uh, bring that, that issue back to the table. Well, before we go down that, uh, we don't have to go. We don't have to. I've said my piece. <laughs> so, uh, looking at our audience here in the auditorium and, and thinking about the people who are joining us uh, online, and again, if you have questions online, just use the Q and A function on Zoom. Um, you're welcome to use the Q and A function here in the auditorium, but um, I, I think that function is just raising your hand. Um, but I, I think about the pictures that I have taken out of airplanes. And most of them have a large wing in the middle of the picture. <laughs> so I'm assuming that when you are on a shoot, you're not just taking pictures out the window. Can you can you describe what it looks like and feels like to be documenting these scenes in Bob Keller's little plane? It feels like being in a in a very small Volkswagen and having a giant shake the car while you're trying to hold the camera still. No, but in 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 all seriousness, uh, it's a very intense process. Um, we start. Pilots are very cautious folks. They have a very um, very thorough checklist. When we start the day. I'm not. GoPros on the wings so that I can shoot video. And then I always have a window that opens because I don't want to shoot through Plexi. And we have a, a set of coordinates that we're going to fly to and we take off. Bob flies from uh, Boonville, which is in the West, as I said. And we go to our locations. And generally, I like to be at about a thousand as low as possible that's the legal limit and we find the thing and then we circle it i try to have an advanced idea of what angle i want and again satellite view helps and but the problem is in a in an airplane and it's usually a high wing cessna you're only in that right position for one second so you get like two frames and then you gotta circle and come back so it's a process and um, the time moves very quickly and your brain has to really be focused on the technical because these cameras are so complex and it's so easy to hit a button which changes a setting and suddenly you go down and you find, oh, the resolution is wrong or oh, so, so you really have to be constantly checking your equipment and and talking to the pilot, and he's talking to the uh, to the air traffic control. So it's a pretty stressful situation. Well, well, and and you know, without getting too technical here, I mean, you were you were joking about this, but how do you hold the camera steady when when the airplane is flying at you know 130 miles an hour or whatever, and and air tends to not cooperate all the time? Um, are you just shooting? Great. Yeah, I mean, are you just shooting at such a high shutter speed that yes. that's okay? And also the, um, the stabilization has got really good in these modern cameras. And although you don't want the stabilization for video, by the way, for the reference point, um, and I've got a steady hand, all of the above. Not too much coffee before you go up. <laughs> and <laughs> that's mostly about no bathroom. <laughs> and, and you also, you know, you try to shoot a couple, even though, as I said, you're only in the right position for a second. I try to blast off three or four frames um, so that if one of them is blurred. And, and does serendipity still play a role? Do you, do you find uh, images that you didn't expect to while you're up there or that you didn't see when you took the picture and you come back and you're, you're going through the shots for the day and you didn't even realize what you had gotten? Good question. And more 
a little bit of that. But what interests me more as an artist is when I take a picture and I don't realize that it's a great picture and someone else has to look at it and like a curator and say, that's the picture. And I say, either I say no, or I say, you're right, that's the picture. So that really interests me when I don't see it. And you, you weren't up there for any of these uh, no, sessions. I wish I was. I, can hear this idea. I hope you got a solid stomach. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> so your first your first view of these uh, photographs was the same way the rest of us got to see them. What surprised you about them? Um, I guess I had high expectations because I uh, I'd been directed to Henry's website first and seen some of his work and, but, uh, and read about his credentials, which are amazing. But then to, you know, to actually see the images of the Adirondacks and, and realize that you're looking at somewhat ghastly things, many of the subjects, but they're exquisitely beautiful. It, it's, uh, it's an amazing contrast. I mean, these, these are so full of irony, these images. It, it just makes them really interesting. And, and I think they, as a result, they can't be dismissed as readily as Henry talked about a few minutes ago, uh, you know, the, a picture of the clear cut and it's, you know, something like that is so obvious. This stuff isn't so obvious. Yeah. It's much more subtle and the pollution impacts and things that we're looking at are actually much more pernicious in long term than, than a mere clear cut. So it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. It's disturbing, but we're disturbed by something that's very beautiful. It's incredibly interesting. Again, it's that irony that works. Henry, you talked about working with a curator here at the Adirondack Experience. Did, did you have experiences as you just described them where you were surprised by what the curator saw that you had missed? Oh, absolutely. You know, as a um, I love what humans can do. I'm working, I'm collaborating on a project with um, a pianist on uh, Bach's Goldberg variations. And we will use uh, pictures of brown coal mining in Germany over her play of Goldberg, which is a staggering piece of music. The point being, the things that humans can do, the things that we, we're all amazing at something. And I love collaborating with people because they bring something, they bring another skill that I don't have to the table. And we, as we were talking about the Beatles before, the four of them were more than the sum of the parts. And it's the same with any human collaboration. You know, a curator brings to brings another view on my work and brings her specialty and um, and show might show me something that I didn't see in my work. And you, you also have to be, I think, um, self confident enough in your own work to be willing to see what other people see in it. Yes. There, you know, you're even you're if they have up. to whack me up. Well, there. right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're giving up a little ownership when you do that. Yeah, 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 and you have yeah. to be willing to do that. Why, why, why did you end up choosing photography as a means towards environmentalism? I mean, which came first for you? Photography came first, but I've always been, um, and this I, I, I have no explanation for. Why do I have? deep feeling for the wilderness. And it might come from my childhood floating down these rivers that we were talking about in South Carolina and you know, communing with nature. I don't know, but I something in me knows that we humans are inseparable from nature. And if we don't take care of it, and nature is not deer wandering through your backyard, nature is wolves and deer doing what they do together. Um, nature is 
with our human manipulation. And um, some, something in me knows that we are dependent on nature, on law nature. And so when did you first marry your abilities in photography with understanding the influence you could have on people on how people see nature. It took a long time. I started, I also am fascinated by the, the hand of man, the machines that we make, the things that we make that do these things. And I started photographing that stuff, trying to tell this story about the importance of our relationship with nature, but it wasn't the pictures were more documentary, not art. And slowly I hit, I realized that getting above it and being able to eliminate the horizon, which therefore changes it from being, you know, a terrestrial landscape to being an abstract form. And then realizing that making something abstract was more impactful than a representation, you know, as soon as it became an abstract and not immediately recognizable, it becomes more interesting. I wonder if we want to take another, take a look at another uh, photograph here, or I can give you a moment to bring one up. Um, I'll go ahead and bring them up. We have had a lot of people asking to specifically talk a little bit about each one and mostly okay. the question of where they're from. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll ask Ed this question. You are a photographer as well. Uh, uh, in fact, you were talking earlier, and you snuck out with your uh, with your gear to uh, to, to chronicle. Um, uh, I think the the lake. Um, uh, beautiful view here. That experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you, uh, you? Where do you fall on the documenting versus photography for for art's sake? In what do you do? We shoot mostly the beautiful things, and. I guess my photography is <laughs> <laughs> they, they are in a different way. Not, you know, I'm more out to show sort of nature, you know, in its original sense. And so very different from what Henry shoots. But it's interesting. One of my, if I think back of favorite photographs of mine I've taken over the years, sometimes I'm surprised at what I like. And one of my favorite shots is a shot of a paper mill at Port St. Joe in Florida where toilet paper is made. And there are just mountainous piles of trees coming in from forests being clear cut, being churned through that plant, turned on the toilet paper. And it was, it was a dark, cloudy day with billowing clouds. It's a really sinister image. And I don't shoot that kind of stuff normally, but it's one of my favorite photographs that I've taken of anything. So, uh, uh, so I'm always open to serendipity. I, I guess I shoot the ugly sides of nature. I, I post my photographs twice a week to, to a lot of people. And uh, if I photograph a, a, pr a predator feeding on a prey, I photographed a, a, a garter snake eating a, a pickle frog in, in a marsh at the Paul Smith Visitor Center one time. And a lot of people found that image quite objectionable. I got complaints about my posting. But, you know, we need we need to see the good that we have. Well, but that's, that's a you know that for me the interaction of predator and prey is that's, that's nature at work. Yeah, and we need predators because prey animals reproduce without limit if they don't have predators. Nature is not rated G. Nature is yeah. not rated G, and nature is a balance. And um, again, working at a wolf center, I I learned all this stuff in detail, and and it's so important. And let's let's talk about this photograph that's uh, that's behind us now because I think if people didn't know the context, you might look at this and think it was a close up of a Douglas fir. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's one of the best ones in the exhibit, and the curator Laura picked that out, uh, and I'm glad she did. Uh, to see the print, it's really stunning because the amount of detail it's it becomes an infinite uh, variation. Like Goldberg variations, sorry, uh, that block on the brain. And um, to see it in the, it, it doesn't do it justice here. You 
got to see the print in the exhibit. It is the um, the tailings from the garnet mine, and uh, there being there's a giant machine with an arm which is dribbling them out, and it's just dribbling down a hill and and separating into these uh, thousands of different rivulets. One thing that we, we don't necessarily, and, and maybe this is part of the point, there's not a built-in sense of scale here. We have no idea what <coughs> square footage. Correct, and I do that here. purposefully, obviously, because again, if we can create an abstract, it becomes more interesting. Right. Just by virtue of no, no physical reference, we look at it and try to figure that out. And you know, before this one, two, two, maybe two images before this one um, was a picture of, uh, and again, I have to credit. Oh, there's the machine. You can see it dribbling the um, the overburden. Um, it was a picture of Low Lake, and again, I credit my pilot Bob. Yes. Because he guided me to this place, which wasn't on our agenda. And it's in the Western Adirondacks. It's not as glamorous as the high peaks, but it's stunningly beautiful. And somewhere in here should be a picture of one of the bald islands, which floats in this lake. Um, it's, a, it's a living island of organic matter. Obviously, this was in the very early spring, and yes, there it is. And the um, deciduous trees, yeah, it's an Indian head, isn't it? I it love, looks like Australia. Yeah, I love seeing <laughs> anthropomorphic shapes in, um, but that is a living, that is an island of living matter in Low Lake. <laughs> Uh, the, the, you know, we've got the lights on, which the, the color is not so rich as uh, one would like it to be. This one is also not in the exhibit because the exhibit was about the environmental impacts, not about the view. Let me stop you for one second. How, how much time are you spending with each subject? I mean, you weren't, weren't doing, it's not one day per photograph, right? I mean. No, we fly with an agenda. We fly from a given field wherever either Bob comes and gets me. Bob is my pilot that I work with in this area, but I have pilots all over the world. Um, <clears throat> we fly from a specific airport and we have, usually before we fly, I've already given him a set of GPS coordinates uh, with a description and he loads them into his onboard GPS unit. But um, we're old friends, and Bob knows that I love the history that he knows. And so this was a, a detour. And we, it wasn't much of a detour. We were on our way up to Messina, and um, he showed me this lake. And we've flown over it twice now because it was so beautiful the first time and it was winter still or at the end of winter. And then when we flew again in the beginning of spring, I said, oh, let's go over to Little Lake. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's, we have an agenda, but, but then we also, you know, then luck plays a chance, plays a role. It's interesting, as you probably know, Henry, but Lowe's Lake was created by an industrialist. It's not a natural lake. It's I did know. It's held back by a dam. And, yes, uh, I think yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. Well, or did yeah, I? No, I did. Augustus, Augustus Lowe, who had more patents than anyone in America, and Thomas Edison, uh, <laughs> many years ago. Apparently. On what? Well, all sorts of different things. But I think is he he was trying to create a, an industrial scale maple sugaring empire. That's why we had one of that. Built built two dams and had his hydropower for the village and his workers built the, wow. built himself a big house. And, but today it's a beautiful wild it's just area. A beautiful lake. It's uh, you know one of the quintessential places where canoeer, canoers uh, go and, and kayakers to have the, the great wilderness experience. But the, the wilderness that they're seeing is a man-made wilderness. So it's <laughs> well, and that's a, wire, wire that's wire. a relevant point, yeah. which is that we can't go back. Right. We must go forward. 
and um, the Adirondacks is not the same as, as our forefathers found, um, but at the same time, it is amazing, and we need to, you know, bring it cool. We do have a question here in, in our studio audience. Yeah, if we're all walking in nature, we don't have to get it from the camera onto paper, but your prints are immense and the color is extraordinary. Do you mind giving us some technology how you get it from the camera onto the sheets? Well, I'm, um, if I can humbly say, <laughs> um, I like to think of myself as a master craftsman. For me, art requires mastery of craft, which is a bit of a curse of mod the, the, the modern technology of photography, because anyone can go buy um, a, a high-end camera, and that camera will do all of the technical things for you, by and large. You don't need to know what I had to study so many years to know how to expose, how to properly expose film, et cetera, et cetera. What's an aperture? What does it do? What's the relationship between that? Okay, fine. Um, I'm using high-end digital cameras uh, because they are better than film ever was. I mean, you were in there in the, in the exhibit hall, so you saw that picture of the dribbling infinite variations, I think I called it. And um, we could never get that with a film. You would have to, the film camera that could make that kind of reproduction would be a camera like this. And they use them for aerial photography, but you couldn't have gotten what I got with one of those giant, we call it an eight by 10 large format camera. So I'm using a high-end digital camera. The brand doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm very good at holding, at being steady, um, as we discussed. But then in post-production, Photoshop, if you will, but it was the dark room, um, my, the technical knowledge, the craft which I developed over many years working in a dark room, many, many years. I was taught darkroom by an old black man named Walter Johnson. And Walter said, Henry, don't you ever give me a print that doesn't have a black black and a white white and a full range of grays. <laughs> and it's the same with digital. If you don't have a pure black and a pure white, then the image won't have a full range of grays or colors. And that's what you've probably seen the histogram. Somewhere you've seen it, the, the graph that goes with every picture. It's, it's a little graph that's usually in the corner of your camera viewfinder or something. That histogram is showing you a graph of all the pixels within that picture. And you get that same graph in Photoshop and you can, I don't even look at a picture as I'm adjusting it in Photoshop. I'm going by the numbers, by the graph. And I wanna see a black, black and a white, white and a full range of tones in between. And then I, I do the same thing when I send it to the printer. Um, I don't print those at home. I, I've got a small printer, not a big one. They're printed at a lab. And I do a test print. I'm very rigorous at how I want my prints to look. And then I do the final print. Um, and these are printing uh, traditionally was um, was a silver chemical process. Um, those it's, it was called C prints, you know, where you actually went into a dark room and you had a light sensitive paper. Now it's almost entirely inkjet prints. C prints work. Um, you can hardly find a C-print lab anymore, and that's probably a good thing. There's a reason why Rochester is one of the most toxic places in America. <laughs> There's a reason why Love Canal is near Rochester. Yeah. <laughs> I won't mention any names. 
Um, but it rhymes with Modak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and, and if I might say, the, the, the picture we were looking at, I think it was the first one we talked about, the picture of the high peaks, yeah. um, that your, your approach to black blacks and white whites and infinite variations of grays and, and other shades in between really comes out in that image. Because if you don't have a black black in any picture, if you don't have a black black and a white white, then and white white means base paper and black black means 100% black, then if there's no black black, it won't look rich. And if there's no white white, it won't look snappy. So thank you, Walter Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. Oh, we just uh, jumped. If we could go back to the previous, there, there's there's a lot of gray in this uh, image, uh, but the shadows are really black, black. What are we looking at here? You know, I'm flabbergasted by this image. It's at Tall's. Someone clearly arranged these piles of material, and we can see. Uh, tracks there from a um, uh, bobcat or something. Why did someone put these these things in this in these regular piles? You know, sometimes humans can't be explained. Maybe there was a reason. Maybe they had nothing better to do. I don't know. Um, but it makes for an interesting picture. <laughs> And of course, it's Taws, which was uh, a pretty interesting place in itself. Um, I'm told Taws was, and Ed, you probably know this better than me. I always thought it was lead, but it wasn't lead. It was um, titanium. Titanium mining came later, but it might have been. You know, Ray? Iron? What were they asked after their first? It was iron and the titanium was a impurity. That, yeah. but they, and then later they went back and yes. got the titanium. They, the iron, they had trouble getting. Did I read that? Because of the impurities. And do you know what we use titanium for? Teox. It's what makes everything white. And it's very, very toxic. So there are, there are like four Teox facilities in the U.S. I photographed three of them at that. Anyway, I'm, uh, yeah. Have, it's, it's it's a What's that? We have a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a comment. Um, this is a comment on a question, but they are trying to get things to start growing again on those tables, trying to help oh. restore the landscape. Oh, ah, cool. So that's what, I think that's in reference to the images. That's what they're doing on this pile. They're trying to make them nice. Yeah. Ah, Rewild them. Yes. Who are the people that you look at as, as having contributed to your approach or, or inspired uh, or the photographers that came before you that you look up to uh, either consciously or, or subconsciously who might have contributed to, to the photographer you are today? I look as much at um, other artists when I was thinking of a title for this exhibit, for this talk, I was obsessing on Beethoven and thinking of uh, listening to a piece and reading about it. And Beethoven took his inspiration from the same little bear. And that's what where I got the, the title. Um, Goya. Cooper knocked over by Goya. He, you know, he was a man who during the daytime, he painted portraits of the of the royalty, and then at night he painted the black paintings, which are some of the the most imaginative and political paintings in Western history. Uh, the photographer whose name I can't remember, who died shooting the Chernobyl accident, uh, is one of my real heroes. Um, Toulouse for Trek. So 
I look more to a range of artists than to give them, certainly the many photographers that I admire and think of, Edward Weston, the list is long, but yeah. But it's not, it, it, it isn't strictly speaking photographers who inspired you, know, it's, it's the range of artists. Yeah. Um, we probably have time to talk about one more uh, one more image here. And this you might know, you know, again, without the without the context, one might think that this is a close-up of capillaries. Yeah, and this was very close on the way up to Low Lake. And um, of course it's deforestation. And I'm always mindful of the of the important trade off between jobs and environment. We need jobs. We have to give people gainful livelihood or else society will break down. And what we've got to do now is find that balance between how can we save nature and give people meaningful work. And I believe we can. I believe that the answer is give people meaningful work preserving nature. Um, we as a society have to figure out how to pay for that, um, but it's really important. That's, of course, deforestation. Forestry is still a big part of the Adirondacks, and it provides a lot of jobs and a lot of income. So it's a balance that has to be struck. Would you, and, uh, and again, if you have, uh, we, we still have time for another question or two, um, but uh, I guess. I'd ask this to both of you. Would you want people to, to be optimistic as they leave tonight's program, as they leave uh, the exhibits? Um, I guess, what, what would you hope people are thinking about and, and feeling once they've had a chance to digest what they've seen? I guess I'd like people to leave with measured optimism. We need to be optimistic because if all this stuff just depresses us and we don't do anything. So uh, I think about that. I think about it all the time when I'm guiding. I, I don't want to uh, whitewash uh, you know, environmental moves. I'm not, I don't really think of myself as an environmentalist, more of a, a naturalist. My focus is, is trying to get people to care and be interested in nature and, and to feel part of nature. And, and then I think hopefully they're thinking and their actions move in good directions. But uh, but again, if I, I could take people for walks and talk endlessly about mercury pollution in the lakes and how they shouldn't eat the fish and, and the ozone pollution in the air. And I mean, there's a lot of, lot of upsetting things to talk about. And I don't ignore those topics, but if I just hit people over the head with them, they would go home depressed. And I don't suspect it would do much good for anyone. So, uh, and, and that's really a neat aspect actually of Henry's work is you, I don't think your reaction when you look at these photos is, 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 is one of depression. One, maybe their breath is taken away at the, the scope of some of the, the disturbances, but I don't know, but just the fact that there's someone like Henry out there who cares and does these, that, that cheers me. And, 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 and honestly, it does, and, you know, and gives me hope that, you know, we're, we're capable of awful things, but we're, we're very capable of getting it together and doing wonderful things too. And I hope that's what people come away with. Yeah, and I would say um, despair is not a productive emotion. Um, I have gotten to the point in my life where it's a challenge to myself to keep my footprint as small as possible. Now, I won't save the world if I don't take a disposable plastic cup, but it does make a difference. So even though there's a great story that we would tell at the Wolf Center, a little girl's walking on a beach, picking up the sand dollar, which is, uh, which is sitting on the beach, the water having gone down and tossing it back into the water and going to the next one and tossing it. And a man comes up and says, little girl, Look, there are thousands of these sand dollars. Uh, they're all going to die. It doesn't matter. You throw in a couple back. She picks up another one and throws it in, and she says, it matters to that one. 
And the same thing, if I turn off every light and if I refuse to take a disposable cup, it ain't gonna save the world, but you know, that's one less piece of plastic in our waste stream. And that's my approach. Keep my footprint as small as I can keep it. And I'd like people to leave and call their congressperson and say, put a tax on, uh, on airplane fuel so that we get rid of those uh, budget airline flights because that's killing us. <laughs> <laughs> Any last questions? Yeah, oh, we have two. Okay, uh, let's go. We'll go to the front row and then the second row. I think uh, climate change is one of the big, or the big environmental issue for the future for the Adirondacks. And if you thought about how you could document that, it's more of a trend. It's not necessarily something you can see happening immediately but and of course what you, you know when we think about it it's a very good question what's the picture of climate change is it is it the polar bear on a melting uh on a melting iceberg um and in fact what i photograph is the making of climate change so whether it's coal which is one of my big topics or airline flight the ninth largest, before COVID, the ninth largest carbon emitter in Europe was EasyJet. Mm -hmm. All those Europeans taking their holiday trips on budget airlines. And we have the same problem here. Um, you know, now that we all fly everywhere, it, it's killing us. It's killing us climate prices. Um, you have qualms about going up with Bob Keller to take these to the uh, Yes, I take the train to see Bob. Um, and he picks me up. At, I take the train everywhere when I can. Um, yeah, I think very carefully about my carbon footprint and how to keep it as lower. Hey, I just flew back from Europe. I am guilty. We're all guilty. We got to figure out a system that we that works instead of one that doesn't work. It also, in answer to Ray's question, one visual thing showing climate change, which you could photograph, and maybe you have already, but just a big change in the 23 years that I've lived year round the Adirondacks, and it used to be very common that lakes around here held their ice into May, the 5th of May or so ice out, maybe even the 10th of May, some years. And now, commonly, we lose our ice on lakes in the middle of March. Wow. That's, that's very visual. <laughs> and that's, and that that's a big difference. That's a huge difference. And that certainly can be seen from the air. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, that's a big question for me is how to photograph climate crisis. Um, and let's take one, one last question. You, in the blue, you had a question. Yeah. Um, it's actually. It's a, it's a worry that by, um, in a sense, you're creating art and beauty out of environmental degradation. And I wonder if you worry that provides kind of an excuse for industrialists. I mean, I've heard, I, you know, I've, I've heard people say that's the look of jobs or, I, you know, I remember being in a town, I, I said, this is an awful smell. How did you live here? And the answer was, that's the smell of jobs. And so I, I worry about that. And I wonder if uh, you've bumped into that at all. Well, and we, we touched that issue at the beginning. Um, if the pictures weren't beautiful and if they weren't ironic, people wouldn't stop to think about them. And for me, there is still an element of horror in each of those pictures. Even though they're beautiful, they're still terrifying yes. on some. So, and that's how I hope, of course, art is a Rorschach. We never know how the viewer will interpret the piece of art in front of them. Um, but my hope is that the viewer will feel the horror that's in each of those pictures, as well as the beauty. And thus that irony, that double entendre will hold their attention. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and I wonder if, you know, there's, there's kind of a false dichotomy at work as well that, that, you know, that there are these infinite shades of gray, that it's not either you have the smell or this beauty and these jobs, or you don't have the smell and you don't have jobs, that there's, there's a way to have a better smell and still have jobs, or there's a way for there to be beauty and still have jobs as well. Well, Civilian Conservation Corps, let's, yeah, I mean, and thank you for that. It is a false dichotomy. Um, we need jobs, we need work for people, meaningful work, but um, let's put those people to work cleaning things up. And we also need jobs that are sustainable. I live in a little town called Bloomingdale, which at one time was one of the bigger towns in the Adirondacks. It's commonly said it was big, bigger than Saranac Lake, which is the biggest town in the Adirondacks today. And uh, you could smell jobs in Bloomingdale 100 years ago. You know, they were cutting the trees down. The old growth forest was coming down. You walk in the woods, it's pretty much all second growth. And, and, uh, and Bloomingdale was a big town, big boom town at one time. It had a traffic light. It <laughs> doesn't have one today. It had a shopping district. It had lots of stores. It, it was a popular place with a substantial population. But uh, so there were jobs, but the jobs didn't last. The resources were remote. Then what? So uh, I think that's a, that's a key thing too. Are we are we in it for the, the short game or the long game? And I think we're we're realizing these days that we need to be we need to be thinking about the long game much more than we ever have. And resource having photographed a lot of this, I think to um, the coal mines in West Virginia, resource extraction tends to impoverish the places where it's extracted. And again. I photographed coal mines and, and old dead coal mining towns in West Virginia, which were once thriving communities. Well, I'm going to turn things back over to uh, Cheryl in just a moment to uh, let people know what uh, programs are coming up at the Adirondack Experience. But before I do that, let me uh, say to Henry Fair and Ed Cans, thank you on behalf of everyone in the uh, audience tonight. Thank you so much for uh, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Ed. And thank you to everybody here at the museum as well as watching us on Zoom. I do appreciate everyone's patience. Obviously, um, this is our first hybrid. There's a little bumps along the road, but we really appreciate everybody sticking it out. So I do want to let you all know what we've got coming up. Um, for the Artists and Inspiration series, we do return to fully Zoom program beginning in October. So please join us on October 24th, and we'll have a program, another moderated discussion focused on Adirondack architecture. For those who are still in the region or still able to come to the region, we have two outstanding last special events for our regular 2022 season. On September 24th, we're bringing you a new event experience for all, which will be free for all visitors. It is a celebration of inclusive um, outdoor recreation. Um, we'll have an expo, hands-on activities, demonstrations, and we're really excited for this program. And our, um, our final event of the season is everyone's favorite Fall Fest, October 2nd, a very family-friendly event, um, a great way to close out the season in the glory of fall. Um, and so we do hope to see you for that and that event will be free for all year round Adirondack residents. So thank you again, and we'll see you on Zoom. Thank you very much to our speakers. It was great to close out um, our in-person evenings with this wonderful conversation. And, and Henry and Ed, Mitch leading the charge, you all were fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>